see. So just by a show of hands, who's ever done any uh, phone gap development here? Okay, Greg. Okay, <laughs> like two and a half. All right. Um, cool. Uh, so let me see. So he did the intro. I can probably skip most of that stuff. Um, the important parts here. So I write code. Sometimes it works. Most of the time it really doesn't. Uh, I think 60% of the time would probably be pretty generous there. Uh, it usually never works. Uh, he mentioned all that stuff. I can skip right over that. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, New Yorkers, just like people from Texas, as soon as we open our mouths, you know exactly where we're from. So I say coffee. Uh, when you hear me say coffee script after, it's, you'll know exactly uh, why. Uh, so let's talk about PhoneGap. Uh, so PhoneGap lets you build cross-platform applications. Uh, the basic premise is uh, that you can build an application in one place and you can run it in many different places. Of course, there's definitely some nuances we'll talk about. Um, in terms of the portability, if you do anything outside of what the framework already provides. Uh, but essentially, PhoneGap lets you actually access APIs and capabilities of the device that you wouldn't generally be able to access within a browser application. Um, so it gives you that native you know, touch and feel, uh, not, although not performance, uh, you know, which when you start talking about people about you know, native versus uh, you know, HTML5 web, it's, it's a religious debate. Um, but anyways, it gives you all those capabilities that you wouldn't generally have in a browser world. Um, so you generally use, uh, for the web part of it, HTML code, JavaScript, CSS. So it makes it really appealing for you know, web developers to move over into the mobile world. Um, because they don't really have to learn anything new. They can just apply the same programmatic stuff that they already know how to do. Uh, PhoneGap is uh, actually pretty well supported. By the way, does anybody actually have a WebOS phone, a Palm Pre, or anything like that in here? Because I was going to give away a beer to anyone that actually still had one of those, but just to kind of ease the pain a little bit. Um, so maybe I'll figure out a way to give a beer away after. I know it's a little early, but it's never too early to start, right? Um, I should probably turn the uh, tweet deck off. But um, anyways, it's, it's pretty well supported across all the major mobile platforms. Uh, so PhoneGap, uh, you'll hear that and uh, Apache Cordova used somewhat interchangeably. So uh, Adobe acquired the company that built PhoneGap. Uh, so uh, Cordova became like the, it's still open source, but uh, they originally went, they called it Apache Callback. And I guess that name was, wasn't too popular. So they eventually moved to PhoneGap and Cordova as the names. Uh, so we'll kind of use them interchangeably, but we're just going to call it phone gap just to kind of keep things simple. Can I ask uh, a question about that? Sure. Do you know if Adobe has done more of the project or Cordova really is the brain trust and the talent? Um, I believe, yeah, there's some, some people that are over at Adobe now still committing and everything like that, still running the project, yeah. Okay. Um, although, like, uh, so phone gap is, uh, so Cordova's on 3.1. Um, if you look at the most recent, like, phone gap release, it's still on 2.9. So it's 2.9 and 2.9. It's a few versions behind the latest Cordova releases. So, uh, so it's actually pretty popular. Uh, Wikipedia, uh, their application is all open source. Uh, Wikipedia is built with it. Um, Untap for those of you beer drinkers. Uh, this application here actually kind of pissed me off because they reported a bunch of bugs some months back. They sat on it for about five months um, and then checked it recently. Like I wanted to use those as demos and they fixed them. So good job, guys. Uh, but this application is great. Like, if you want to cheat on your spouse, you know, do it on the internet because that's the hardest way to get caught, right? Um, it's amazing. They tout everything's like, uh, you know, how discreet it is, and then they even give you the ability to go like Batman style, basically. So you can, you know, throw that mask on. Like, how did no one ever know that was Batman? By the way, I mean seriously. Um, yeah. Huh? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, if, if you want to do that, you know, go to that site. Uh, whatever you do in your time is your business. Uh, there are other frameworks that also leverage PhoneGap. Um, so IBM Worklight. Uh, so Steroids is a recent, uh, pretty recent one, um, but their whole thing is performance. Uh, so they use you know native stuff to do a lot of the view stuff that you know gives you a little speed up, as opposed to doing it you know in HTML5. Uh, so let's talk about I guess the meat of why everybody's here. Is it secure? Uh, the Magic Eight Ball wants to know. Uh, so out of the box, uh, really doesn't do much for you. Uh, compared to other, you know, modern frameworks, you know, talk about web frameworks. So we talk about Rails, Django, you know, newer versions of Spring, you know, ASP.NET MVC. Uh, there's all these built-in things, you know, output encoding to CSERF protections. Like, there's some common controls that are being built in these frameworks. We don't have to think about them. Uh, PhoneGap certainly hasn't done much of that stuff. Uh, the advice that's available to developers on the wiki uh, is, is pretty atrocious. Uh, so they give you recommendations here, uh, how to fix XSS. Who, who believes that you know, using a nonce in a post is actually, it, it, it's just crap. 
Uh, but in any event, like this is the stuff that's out there. So you have you know developers have never done any mobile development, you know, come from a web background, or you know maybe they haven't even done much web development. Um, but then they go to work with PhoneGap and look, oh great, I just use a post and I'm good. Um, the other misconception that's up there, uh, talking about reverse engineering. Uh, so they tout that it's actually harder to reverse engineer HTML and JavaScript than it is to do it to like say, you know, Java and Objective C. Uh, totally bogus. I mean, if you throw it through an intercepting proxy, you know, there you go. Um, if you actually unzip, um, so on Android it's an APK, right? Uh, if you just unzip it, I mean, all the web code is there to be seen. So um, yeah, not really good. Uh, it actually does make it quite a bit easier to reverse engineer applications. Uh, so let's see, I know we're in Texas, so do we have any Cowboys fans here? All right, woo, go Cowboys. All right, so we'll just kind of do a little comparison. So uh, PhoneGap has a lot in common with Tony Romo, so get ready for this one, folks. So yeah, good enough until the fourth quarter. So did anybody actually watch that game, or is it too soon to talk about it? No? Um, maybe I was the only person in the room that was actually cheering when that happened, but it was great. Um, typical Tony Romo, right? Uh, PhoneGap, you know, it's, it's decent. It, you know, if you're relying on the platform provided features, um, those, things are, they, those things work as expected. But PhoneGap itself doesn't really do much for you. And, you know, in the end, you kind of nip yourself in the butt if you don't take those things into account. Uh, so, yeah, we're really not going to trash PhoneGap too hard. Uh, Romo is always fair game because he's a disaster and the most overrated quarterback in the history of the league. Um, so we're going to, you know, so, you know, instead of just pointing out, like, you know, most, you know, talks uh, these days, it's like problem, problem, problem. We're actually going to, you know, try to put some solutions in place and actually fix these things. Uh, so we'll use a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking. So maybe the, uh, Tony Romo will try this. Maybe his career will be a little better. Um, and we're going to focus probably just a little bit more on Android. So a lot of the concepts uh, for Android and iOS are somewhat redundant. Um, iOS actually, there's a few snags on, on the, the Android implementation that aren't there in iOS. Uh, just an experience found the Android implementation is a little more screwed. So we'll focus on Android and we'll just cross reference wherever things are a little bit different for iOS. Uh, and if you're using WebOS, uh, which nobody isn't here, so good for you guys, we'll move on from that. All right, so how does PhoneGap actually work and do all these magical things that it's billed as? Uh, so no security talk would be complete without some kind of cliche architecture picture. Um, so just pointing things out, so in the upper left-hand corner, um, you have your actual web code. So this stuff could be you know, served locally from the device, so this stuff could actually be served from the web. But in any event, you know, that's just like you would think of stuff loaded in a browser, that's your web code and that's that layer. Um, below it is the actual web view that it's actually loaded into. So um, Cordova uh, and PhoneGap, they wrap uh, the existing like, uh, web views, um, they initialize them, build their own things, you know, turning JavaScript on, local storage, um, and those also establish the different communication channels um, to actually be able to talk to the plugins. So the plugins are really where all the magic happens. Um, so the plugins are what you call you know, via JavaScript, and that can give you access to all those native capabilities. And you can also roll your own as well. Um, and if you go on GitHub, I mean, there's, there's tons of different plugins that people have built. Um, some really cool stuff, some really scary stuff, some really stupid stuff, a little bit mix of all the above. Um, and then, of course, you know, all that stuff gets you access to the stuff on the bottom, which is uh, the native capability of the device. Okay. Okay. That's... All right, so we'll just kind of do a walkthrough of what the code looks like on Android, and we'll just discuss, you know, each of those pieces where, you know, there's actually some attack surface. Can you guys actually hear me pretty good now? Okay. Uh, so first off, you have a configuration. Now this is the same thing on both iOS and Android. You have a configuration file where all the stuff set up. Uh, so at the top, you see the access origin. Um, that's actually used to whitelist which domains can actually load uh, web code in your application. Uh, that's actually the default setting there with an asterisk. Can anybody guess the implications of that? Um, that's turned on by default. Uh, by default, it loads from a local index.html. Of course, you can load from the web if you want. Um, and you, you know, most applications do pull code down from the web as well. Um, and then you have a ton of plugins that are enabled by default, which we'll talk a little bit more about that more later. Uh, you have the manifest file on Android. So on, I, uh, on iOS, you don't have that. Uh, so if you want to have permission to do a certain thing, you have to request permission in the manifest. Uh, so these are all the different permissions that are enabled by default um, when you actually create a brand new PhoneGap project. 
Uh, we have web assets, of course, so we talked about those. That's all your JavaScript, CSS, your images, your resources, et cetera. Uh, your plugins, this is kind of what it looks like. So uh, the plugins are going to extend the, um, the Cordova plugin class. Um, there's the execute method, which is the main entry point into your plugins. Uh, so the action is generally used in like, uh, like an if-else kind of thing. Uh, just basically, you know, if that's the action set, then I do A, B, C, D, that's defined in that plugin. Uh, and so you can also return from the plugins. Um, you can return plugin results um, as an array of, uh, you know, binary data. You can return, you know, JSON data. Um, you can actually return stuff back to the actual uh, web layer itself, which is, you know, part of the appeal. Uh, so it interacts, as I said, in several different ways. Uh, first off is if you just want to load a uh, web page, you know, that's pretty much how you get started right there. Um, so that's an activity right there. Um, you extend Droid Gap which extends something else, but in the end, it's just an activity wrapped with a bunch of stuff, um, initializes the web view for you. And uh, the other way, uh, which this is actually like, if you read, you know, so they're trying to deprecate, and they only use it in a few places with a few different plugins, um, but they're trying to get away from doing that apparently, except they still use it in their core plugins. Uh, but this essentially lets you basically, from a plugin, send JavaScript directly back to the web view itself, which can obviously be really, really dangerous. <laughs> Uh, so these are the security features that PhoneGap gives you out of the box. Uh, they give you the ability to whitelist URLs. Um, that's really about it. They really don't do crap for you out of the box. Um, so let's talk about uh, just a few of the, I guess, the broader areas of focus. Uh, a couple broad areas that PhoneGap, uh, you know, has some considerations and things you'd want to lock down out of the box in your applications. Uh, so first off, we hit on these a little bit, but we'll dig a little bit deeper into the insecure defaults. Uh, so for starters, uh, that's what your whitelist looks like. It just basically turn everything on. That's it. It's easy, right? Go home, folks. Um, so this is obviously really bad. So by default, uh, any app, any you know domain can load and execute uh, you know HTML uh, as well as JavaScript in your application because this is actually within the main web view that gets loaded inside that activity we talked about, um, and it just simply turns JavaScript on for pretty much you know anything that's loaded. So. If you're to reload, you know, the new domain, uh, you know, new URL, um, everything has the ability to execute JavaScript out of the box, um, which, depending on um, the plugins that you have enabled, can be really bad. Um, there's no granular control over, you know, which origins can potentially like load and execute uh, stuff from plugins. So, having this on pretty much globally is is, is an ugly thing at times. Uh, so permissions, we touched on these. Uh, so it asks for a lot of different stuff. Uh, in particular, the 16 uh, p permissions enabled by default. Uh, and there's actually three of them that already been used. So um, I thought I was nuts, but I actually went through and found that, yeah, there's just nowhere these are even used. Our receive SMS, our record audio, record video. They don't actually implement them anywhere. So they're just extraneous permissions. Good job, guys. Uh, so we talk about the plugins. Um, so we look at, and let's just bounce to Eclipse for a second. By the way, any questions? I know I'm just ripping through content. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, um, let's take a look at this one right here. Um, uh, so if we take a look at the resources directory, we have. XML, we have the config, so um, load that up. Uh, so you can see out of the box, I mean, every single one of these plugins is enabled. So um, the ability to grab so much geolocation data, um, the contacts, uh, storage. The storage plugin's great because that gives you pretty much, uh, especially the way it's implemented within JavaScript and in the plugin, it's, if you get XSS, you pretty much have like a full SQL browser get anything stored in that device. So um, when you hear people like, oh, you know, it's whatever, there's, you know, sandboxing in place, and, um, you know, local file, you know, system is encrypted, that's great. Until you have XSS and you just pop that stuff out of there anyway. Um, but in any event, all this stuff is enabled by default out of the box. So um, more often than not, I mean, if you go on GitHub and just start kind of browsing around, um, you'll notice that more often than not, I'd say maybe more than 60% of the time, people don't turn this stuff off. Um, and, you know, more often than not, they don't actually use half those plugins anyway.
Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you're developing or you're reviewing an application, you know, definitely want to match up to see if those plugins that are enabled are actually used in any way. Because more often than not, like I said, you're going to find they're not. Has the community said anything about this? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, because it's easier. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and more more developers are lazy, I guess. So I don't know. But I, I totally agree. Yeah, it's 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 crap show. Right, and to follow on, would, have you written a letter? Um, no. So, the, yeah, or, yeah, just so I've written some stuff, and so there's some stuff I want to, you know, possibly, you know, push some pull requests up to them for. Uh -huh. um, there's been a few blog posts, but not. It's really not really well documented, which is shocking, you know. Um, so getting back to it, so uh, XSS is fun again. Uh, so you can do a lot of things, and these are the three primary ways that you can get, you know, script and HTML execution in the application. The first is by, you know, serving content. So you know, this is an XSS talk. I mean, your your knowledge about XSS is 100% applicable here. So you have untrusted data it gets rendered back on the page. Page can't distinguish between what's data, what's code. Your code fires. You win. Uh, the other way is through the uh, actual plugin result. Uh, so we'll take a, a quick look at that, um, and actually let's look at it um, because I made some changes to the one in, in Eclipse. Uh, so let's look at the one that's actually up on GitHub right now. Um, so when you look at the plugin result, um, so you'll notice that um, so this is going to get called within a plugin, and when you want to return data. Um, within an, a Cordova plugin, uh, you would do it through this. And this would, you know, fire off uh, another class. Uh, uh, this would be a part of a, a context, a callback context, which um, has a channel to shuttle stuff back to the web view. Um, but as you can see, nothing is encoded or, or altered by default. Um, so again, when you think about like frameworks like, you know, Rails, what they're doing, and Django, you know, they're output encoding stuff by default. So I mean, if you put it, you know, within, you know, something you know to look for, then it's sent back, and at least it's at least doing HTML encoding, you know, which obviously doesn't fix all types of XSS, but at least fixes, you know, a subset by default. Um, so PhoneGap at this point doesn't have any of that stuff built in. It's just basically what you see is what you get back, um, which is kind of nasty. Yeah. Uh, the other way to do this um, is through uh, send JavaScript, as we said. Uh, so if we take a look at that really quick, um, let's see. This one shouldn't be manipulated. So in the Cordova web view, um, so you have this ability here to So this can be called from any of your plugins as well. Um, so this will just essentially drop JavaScript on a queue that's going to get executed within the web view. Um, so an example of that would be within the storage plugin, which uh, still hasn't fully deprecated this. Um, so there's a, a few places where it's actually, yeah. Uh, so you can see this uh, as it gets sent back here. Um, so you basically essentially have a piece of JS. Um, you can concatenate some stuff into there. Um, does that look pretty good to you guys? Uh, so that's you know how the plugin basically sends it back. So you have messages, you know the same way. So your message stuff gets thrown right into a piece of JavaScript um, as is. So these are pretty dangerous things. Uh, these are these are these are actually distributed with the framework as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean like most of the plugins have actually gotten away from using that. Um, but there's still a handful that are still using it. Uh, if you're developing an application, don't do it that way. All right. Uh, so yeah, I just hit on that actually. So nothing's output encoded by default. So um, you're actually on the hook for handling that if you want to do it safely. Uh, in addition to it's you know it's not just you know web content. You know, for example, if you're pulling information from your plugins from you know, contacts, if you're getting SMS messages, and just taking the contents of that and doing something with it, you know, passing it off to the web view. Um, these are all different sources that you have to consider as untrusted data as well. Um, you're not just dealing with, you know, what's actually being returned within the browser's thing. Uh, in terms of the power of it, so obviously it's very dependent on the plugins that you have enabled. 
uh, which you know kind of goes towards basically you know turn it off if you don't need it. Uh, the more you can reduce the attack surface in that manner, the better. Uh, PhoneGap also doesn't provide any mechanism. So for example, if you have the storage plugin enabled and you want to say, hey, I only want code that's served locally from like the file system to be able to access that. Um, they don't have any granular access controls built in for that. Uh, so essentially, you know, third-party site can call those same exact plugins as well. Um, you have absolutely no control. It's either you turn those plugins on um, or you turn them off. There's, there's no in-between at this point. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, some transport layer things. Uh, does anybody have any questions about all that stuff before I move on? Yes. Did you say that uh, HTML encoding or leaks is done by default? Mm -mm. First method? Nope. Oh, okay. I thought I misheard that. Mm -mm. No encoding. No. Let me get you an example here. Um, I brought up an example. Um, let me show you a live demo of that, I guess. Uh, nothing too cool, but. Um, so here's a plugin here, and it just returns um, a script tag within uh, a piece of JSON. So it returns the plugin result is a JSON object with JSON already in there. And so we'll just start it up um, in the emulator. Uh, but in any event, from there, it is actually returned and called within index.html. Uh, so within index.html, um, so we have another iframe in there, but um, where's she at? Let's see, let's look at the Jack.js for a second. Um, so you can see inside of here, uh, we just call that back and we're just using jQuery just to manipulate the DOM. So we just basically uh, get that back, we do a parse JSON on it, and then we do an append. So we just append it right to the button basically. Um, so it's untrusted data, you know, and it just gets thrown into the DOM. So we'll see an example of that now. Yeah, by the way, for anyone that does any testing, uh, Jenny Motion is great. Uh, performance is amazing. For some reason, today it just decided that it didn't want to. Uh, thanks, uh, Dave. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, Jenny Motion's really fast. Um, so, yeah, they virtualize instead of emulate. The performance is great. Um, just for some reason, uh, let's see, I, I think I broke this. Um, or maybe not. Uh, yes, I did, because I, I whitelisted and. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. So you can see that piece of, you know, that, that data within that JSON just, it was just as what you see is what you get there. Uh, so I didn't break my demo after all. All right. Um, so any questions uh, beyond that before I move on? Okay. Uh, so we'll talk about transport layer issues. Um, so under normal conditions, uh, you know, as we expect with an HP client, um, if the certificate has any issues, it should break. Um, but then there's some other, I guess, little gotchas that aren't really well documented, which we'll discuss. Uh, so this one is, this one's a gem right here. So um, anytime you see, you know, somebody whining that you have the debuggable flag set, uh, you know, debuggable turned on and the manifest, say, ah, okay, whatever. Um, even though there's issues, you know, people downplay it. Uh, PhoneGap does something really nice to you where they, if you have that enabled, they turn off um, your SSL chat. Uh, so, not really the best thing to do. Um, so that would be a recommendation, like uh, turn that off when you actually deploy into production. Um, there's really no easy way to pin certificates um, because uh, if you're just using you know the code over that jar out of the box, um, you don't have low enough you know level access of how the HP you know client actually works. Um, so there's one implementation out there. This is actually available. Like uh, if you look on PhoneGap build. Uh, this is one of like the you know featured plugins. Um, so this is how they're you know suggesting that you attempt to pin a certificate. Um, of course, anybody. Let's see. Anyone? Can anyone take a guess that if, what's the significance of if you actually serve this over the web initially? Um, so say you make a call out, right? Uh, HTTPS connection or even HTTP. You pull this down this JavaScript. What have you already broken at that point? Anyone? Trust. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, if you can manipulate that, you know, in route, and of course it also depends on your level of paranoia, right? Um, but, you know, the appeal of certificate pinning is that, you know, you put, uh, you basically 
Um, you take it away from the CAs at that point, and you say, hey, whoever's on the other end, you know, I would expect that, that the pub key that I've uh, put in place you know, matches up with their pride, then it just all handshakes and works. Um, but if you're serving it up in this manner, um, you're pretty much breaking the, any of that trust. Um, so as you can see, you know, underneath the hood, they you know, just basically make an HP call. Um, if it matches up, then they return success, and if not, uh, the other part of the problem with this, um, so you can look that it's all dependent upon using callbacks. Um, so the way they recommend using this is that uh, when the application's open, developer calls that, they check to make sure that um, you know, the certificates properly match up and it's trusted. Um, and then they also expect you to actually call that every time you make a subsequent uh, HPS call. So um, when you put an implementation like that in place, and you, you know, it's all dependent upon how well a developer implements it, you're setting them up for failure. It just never works. Um, so like I said, they don't make it easy at all to do certificate pinning. Uh, cool, so now we talked about everything that's broken within PhoneGap. Um, what am I doing on time? Cool. Uh, so we talked about everything that's broken in PhoneGap. So let's talk about ways to fix things. Uh, so I've been working on just a secure fork. Um, you know, maybe they'll implement some of these ideas. i uh, will have to push some of them up. Uh, but for now, just kind of dabbling with uh, some stuff outside of what they're doing. Um, it's a fork of uh, 2.9, which that's what PhoneGap's on now, so we're just kind of working with that version. Um, so available for Android, uh, not a, a great, uh, I have a hate, hate thing with Objective-C. Um, I hate Objective-C and Objective-C hates me. Uh, so if anybody, I know Greg's an awesome uh, iOS developer back there, and, yeah, and there's a handful of people. If anybody actually wants to work on some of this stuff for iOS, I'd be more than happy to share ideas with you. Um, but for now, uh, just working on it, proof of concept for Android. Uh, so it sounds fancy, right? What does it actually do? Uh, so trying to basically take away the uh, kind of gotchas out of the box. So for example, you know, there's some things that are just so easy to solve, like the insecure defaults. Um, there's no reason for that, right? There should be, should just be off and then turn it on as you need it. Uh, so does it solve all your security issues? Uh, absolutely not. You know, nothing solves all the security issues. You know, there's no you know shining unicorn that does it all. Um, if anybody tells you that, they fold it. Um, so things we're working on right now. Um, so turning off the insecure defaults. Uh, there's no reason for that stuff to be there. So just basically, uh, essentially, to work as a template. So the Cordova library has some changes, some tweaks in it, um, and then you know you basically pull it in as a template. Uh, and then you can dump all your stuff in there, but everything's already turned off at that point. Um, the other option is to actually change the way the, um, so if you ever build a phone gap application, uh, there's some build tools that come with it where you create like um, the templates. So either one, just modify those slightly, um, or two, just use it this way. We just pull it as a project and do your magic on it. Um, so there's a few other things actually. So like things that are really easy to fix. Uh, for example, why isn't there any output encoding of stuff coming from plugins, right? Uh, that's really easy. It's all done in one central place. Uh, it's done within the plugin manager, uh, the plugin result rather. Um, let me pull this up here. Uh, so we just added a few different things. Um, where is she at? And I lost it. Um, there it is. All right, so yeah, nothing fancy at all. So we just added a few things uh, in addition to the regular configuration, uh, added a security configuration. Uh, so a uh, few classes that we don't want to call, we can, you know, white looks classes that we don't want to look at. Um, but then also uh, look at the security configuration. So for each um, plugin, uh, by default, HTML encoding is enabled. So if you don't actually manually disable it, then you'll have encoding out of the box, um, which I think is, is easy enough to do. So we actually use the uh, OWASH Java encoder to do that. Um, so it was between, you know, that, uh, SAPI, Coverity's library, um, so it just ended up that OWASP encoder was a little bit, you know, faster and, um, you know, actually a smaller jar. So it actually doesn't bloat the size of your APK as much. Um, so that's there. There's really nothing complicated about that. It's just simply running it through an encode. And you break so many issues at that point. Uh, let's see. Next up. Um, so actually being able to whitelist individual domains that can load JavaScript. So um, you might have, say, like a content distribution domain where maybe you're pulling down images. Um, you know, and some things, but that doesn't need to execute JavaScript, right? Um, so it's enabled globally, right? As we showed before, that uh, when those web views are instantiated, JavaScript's enabled. So why can't you just basically manually say, you know, kind of like how you do with um, 
uh, no script, you know, that kind of concept basically, where you say these domains can execute scripts, um, but these domains can only load HTML. Um, you know, so you break some stuff in that way as well. Uh, the TLS stuff, so turned off uh, that stupid uh, trust all host thing. Um, so there's also an issue as well, like if you look at some of the plugins, uh, for example, the file utils. Um, I'm sorry, uh, file upload. Um, yeah, I'm losing mine. Yeah. Uh, so we went ahead and uh, basically, so there's a few plugins, and this would be you know, how we'd recommend. Um, so you have discrepancies, like so some places you might have, they actually in this one give the, the developer the ability via JavaScript to turn off SSL checks, um, which is stupid. Uh, so anyways, like um, I guess my idea is that like it's easier if it's just basically an all on or all off type of thing. I mean, if you really need to disable on a per plugin basis, um, I mean, I'd imagine if you're using it in a dev environment, you'd either want to turn it on or turn it off. Um, but so I think just basically centralizing that control makes it easier uh, not to hang yourself. And uh, also turned off um, within, uh, let me see here. Uh, so we got that one and then we also turned off another place with a debuggable flag. Um, so that also follows the same thing. So there's one, uh, because developers don't know that's going to happen, so they're going to fail when they do that. Uh, so that all follows the same setting as well. So SSL is either enforced in all on or all off. Um, so also made it easy uh, via configuration to also pin your certificate uh, and also uh, pin for multiple domains as well. Um, so that's all enabled uh, within a security configuration file. Uh, so we just simply add an additional configuration. Uh, so here's a few things that are in there. Uh, so you're able to put, you know, public key, um, you can specify by domain and you can turn it on or off. Um, so kind of working on stuff with origin access, that's not fully flushed out yet. Um, but there's a handful of things, I'm just going to keep adding features. Uh, actually one idea which I actually kind of sort of stole from Greg, the way they implement it in the IMAS framework, um, is how to actually do encrypted storage. Uh, so just implement a wrapper for SQL Cipher. Um, it's just really easy to do. So basically you can just drop it in there and have you know, instant encrypted storage in your application. Um, it should be seamless, uh, especially because uh, the way SQL Cipher works, anybody's actually ever used it. Um, so pretty much it follows the same syntax. The only real big difference is that um, you have to specify you know, an encryption key, um, but it's just easy enough to basically take that out of the hands of the developer and just wrap it right into the framework because uh, most phone gap applications, there's zero file encryption or you know, data protection um, within app. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so that's kind of sort of got that a little bit working. I still have to work on that a little bit. Um, one thing that I haven't totally figured out, and if anybody actually digs into this, um, I'd be happy to exchange ideas, uh, is how to actually enforce you know, origin policies on a per plugin basis. So like, um, if you pass something in, like they say in like be an iframe, the current you know, way that it actually passes in like the domain, it'll actually take like the document.url of like um, the, you know, the, the outer frame and stuff like that. Uh, so just trying to figure out like a real clean way to pass that in um, when that actual, you know, domain that's loaded with a frame or something like that, um, you know, or something that makes like a cross-origin, you know, request, um, actually we try to call that. So if anybody has any ideas or actually takes a look at this, I'd be happy to, you know, bounce ideas back and forth to kind of solve that problem. Um, and if there's anything specific to your environment or just things you stumble across, you say, hey, um, you know, let's basically right away, you know, let's make it something that's part of the framework to make this easier as well. Um, be happy to basically take requests uh, to implement things as well. Uh, let's see, and that would be it, folks. Um, any questions? Yes? So, I, I'm under the impression that PhoneGap produces output that's ready to go into an app store. Um, Maybe not, but so is HardCap, are you, uh, HardGap, are you producing output that can go into an app store, that's ready for the app store, or is it just uh, yeah, it should still, so I mean, it's still using the same, you know, the only difference is some tweaks to the Cordova library. Uh -huh. 
um, you know, added you know, an additional security API on top of that. Um, so essentially it should operate the same. I mean, performance should be, you know, uh, really no performance in or anything like that. So um, in terms of, you know, so I mean, I wouldn't say use this today. Like I'm still working on it. It's definitely like uh, got some bugs to flesh out. But um, yeah, I mean, in the end, you should be able to deploy this to an app store as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, to add to that, Jack, when you, when you build PhoneGap for an Android, mm -hmm. which is a very thin Android app that has all this PhoneGap stuff on top, mm -hmm. that was deployed right into Google, Google Play. Right. I mean, in the end, like you'll see, you know, some applications they take the, you know, the way of that they, you know, they'll load a lot of resources locally. You know, so they'll have the HTML, the JS there, and stuff like that. Um, but most applications, you know, pull stuff down from the web as they go as well. So, um, yes, yeah, so just like Greg said, it's a little bit, you know, sometimes you'll see the APK is a little bit light. Um, but all that content and functionality is served from the server side. Um, so you get that hybrid view of some stuff's native, some stuff is coming down from the web. So gives us job security in the end. So um, any other questions, comments? I think that GitHub doesn't have the code on it yet. You might not Still got to push it up, yeah. Yeah. Um, what else? Yes, sir. I'm curious, you mentioned something that I can catch the name that virtualizes uh, Jenny Motion, uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, recommend it. Uh, yes, uh, right here. Um, so it uses VirtualBox. Um, yeah, just performance is incredible compared to the emulator. Uh, truthfully, the emulator is a huge pain in the ass. So like, you know, if you're doing this stuff on a regular basis, either use a device or use Jenny Motion. Just avoid the emulator. It's just, it's slow. It's clunky. Um, I've never been a huge emulator. Fan. Yes. What? Uh, no, uh, free. So, yeah, it was based on our Android. Uh, was it Android VM? I think it was called before, or Android VM, something like that. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's. Uh, I think they're building some monetized services on top of it, but um, the basic usage. Uh, and they have like VMs for a couple different, uh, you know, common devices. Um, you know, so like the Nexus, uh, all the Nexus devices, like the Galaxy S4. I really do have to turn and tweet that go off. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely recommended. Um, uh, any other questions? Yes. What is it that you're using instead of PowerPoint there where you're zooming in the Oh, uh, Prezi. Um, P R E Z I, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just uh, some, some people go overboard with their Prezi's where they just stuff spins and you just kind of like nauseous about five minutes into it. So, um, but yeah, if you don't go overboard with the animations, it's actually pretty cool. I, I find that it, like, it's, it's easy to be conversational in your presentations as opposed to be like, boom, slide, boom, slide, boom, slide. So, um, yeah, it's P-R-E-Z-I.com. Um, any other questions? Jack, is, yes. is HardGap like an add-on to PhoneGap? In other words, I, if I had a PhoneGap project, would I just uh, pull down your HardGap library? So that you, yeah, you could, pull in, you could pull in Cordova. Um, so it's basically most of it is tweaks within Cordova. Um, so like within your project, you'd have, for example, uh, looking down here at this guy, yeah. uh, you'd have your Cordova.jar. Um, so you look, for example, so that's Cordova test. I just built that. Uh, but in any event, that has all the, you know, phone gap, you know, all the, so basically the, the tweaks are in the actual Cordova library itself. Okay. Um, and then pushing that into a project. Um, it yeah. It's so like the next part will probably be, you know, to actually modify, um, you know, just the default build out of the box so it actually turns all that stuff up. But for now, just basically going to provide it as, you know, a template. It's got the library in there, just drop it in, start writing your web code, and you should be okay. Uh, anyone else? Five minutes. What, what do you think the future of phone gap? Obviously, it's a it's going around now, it's gap, and yeah. just like whether that gap will, will end the industry or you think this is a long term. Um, yeah, so I guess it's, a, you know, so you look at like, you know, Facebook got away from HTML5, uh, LinkedIn got away from HTML5. Um, but then you start to see like there's, there's frameworks that are being built around this and they're you know, trying to balance out like the performance with like the ease. Um, so I mean long term, I mean I think HTML5 is going to be, it's going to do well, but um, is that where you're going with that? I mean I wouldn't say HTML5, you know, especially I mean, you look at like Firefox OS, I mean you know, it's somewhat the future I guess. Um, but you can't write native off yet, I mean native is not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, anything else? Uh, 
Like, you mean? They started as a producer group of guys that wanted to put this thing yeah. together and then Adobe purchased them. Right. And then we think Adobe, because it's an Adobe product, they are focusing <laughs> much on security. Uh, I mean, you would hope they do, but it clearly, you know, I mean, so they patched, I guess, you know, issues. There was a, an issue with like phone gap build, they patched, you know, um, actually I gotta look because like the issue was closed and then they reopened it because it wasn't fixed and I haven't actually looked to see if they actually fixed that. Um, so I mean, I guess they do a decent job of that stuff, but in terms of building into the framework, um, that obviously leaves a lot to be desired at this point. Dave. Does phone gap give you any options to encrypt the data on a different store on the device? Uh, no. no. So that's one of the things actually, kind of using the same approach Greg used um, for his framework. Uh, do something similar that you just have that inherent control out of the box. But no, short answer is no, including HTML5 local storage and stuff that's actually stored in the SQL, like DB, and then file storage as well, because you can also store files, share preferences, stuff like that. Um, and same thing, obviously. Um, so there is a, a keychain, there, there are a few keychain plugins for iOS, um, but for Android, yeah, not much. But there is some stuff to put stuff in the keychain. But then, of course, um, if you can write to the keychain, uh, so you have JavaScript that calls plugin on iOS that you know, does stuff keychain, then obviously you can also pull stuff out of the keychain with XSS as well. So, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things is that like, you know, people always want to hear, um, that's great, that's a problem, but how can you actually get to it? So like in a pure native application, um, some, of the things, some of these things are arguably harder to remotely exploit. Um, but when you have the ability to, you know, remotely execute scripts, then suddenly, you know, it opens up a whole new wave of issues. And, you know, it definitely changes the threat model for your application as well at that point, so. Um, I got two minutes, so one more question? Cool, guys. Um, thanks. <laughs>